So it's six o'clock. Um, we'll get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Glad you all joined us for session two of Learn Your Land. Um, if anyone is having any te technical difficulties, uh, please let me know via the chat box uh, or raise your hand in, in the um, participants list there. And um, either myself or one of the other co-hosts will be sure to, to uh, get to you and make sure we have everything sorted out. So tonight, uh, session two, we're going to be discussing uh, identifying, inventorying, and mapping your property. So in session one, we, we covered kind of the basics of what land stewardship means, and we talked a little bit about some of the ecological principles associated with that. And then Michelle guided us through some management decisions and some issues on our own property. And tonight we'll kind of continue that conversation, but we'll we'll take it a step further and a little more specific, and we'll get into uh, the importance of of inventorying uh, what we have on our properties and our land, and some mapping tools and resources that are available to us to do such things. And then uh, we'll get a little more into uh, more in depth with another case study, and we'll look at uh, some further examples of how to elaborate on this process and get into some more detail. So just a reminder to, to everyone, um, and I have expressed this uh, a number of times in the emails, but we, we have a few new, uh, new attendees since the first session. So just wanted to remind everyone that we do have a landing page for this project. And on that page, you'll find all the information that you need for the series. Uh, so yeah, there is a direct link down here and I've sent that around in the email, but the easiest way to get to it is just to go to our cceduchess.org website and then uh, scroll down a little bit and you'll find the, the, the spotlight here in the middle that says learn your land. If you click on that, that'll take you right to the landing page. And there you'll find the agenda, all the homework activities. Um, we're posting uh, PDFs of all of our presenter slides following the session. And then also a day or two later, I'll have uh, the, all these videos are being recorded so you can share them and view them later. And they'll be up a day or two after, after this, each session. There's also a good number of links, tools, and resources that we're putting up there pertaining to uh, some of the, the, the tools that we're mentioning in these sessions uh, or other videos or um, guides. Uh, and then I also did want to just uh, note one more time, uh, we, we, for the last session, we did put up a, a short evaluation and we'll have a more in-depth one uh, following the final session next week. Uh, and. So just again, those evaluations are really helpful for us. They help us to determine uh, how to best cater these programs to, to all of you and uh, what to um, include in our programming in the future. So uh, I'll, I'll harp on this again next week um, when we have a final evaluation. And thank you to all of those who, who did fill out uh, one for the first session. Your, your feedback has been extremely helpful and we appreciate the kind words. Um, there were just two things from that uh, first evaluation that I just wanted to mention, um, someone had asked about uh, the participants list and if it was possible to make that um, live during the session. And, and unfortunately, the way the webinar is set up, uh, it, it doesn't allow me to do that through Zoom, but I, I can um, definitely make that attendee list uh, public for everyone and put it up on the, the landing page if that's useful. Um, and the, another comment was just trying, again, kind of along the same lines, trying to make things more interactive. Uh, and we're trying our best to do that with using the chat box and the polls. Um, and tonight we'll actually be hearing from uh, three of our attendees who are gonna uh, give an overview of their homework assignments. So uh, hopefully we can continue the great uh, interactions and comments we had last session last week. And uh, please feel free to use that chat box uh, liberally. So tonight's outline, um, Again, we're going to kind of start off with just a discussion of the homework and, uh, and, and kind of see how everyone did with that. Uh, after that, I'll get into an introduction to inventories and their importance. Following that, uh, Nate, uh, so Nate and Artie Cyrus and myself will be the two main presenters tonight. Uh, Nate and I will get into some mapping tools and resources uh, for both Dutchess County and the, the Hudson Valley and, and New York State as a whole. Uh, and then we'll take a quick break again, just trying to keep everyone fresh and uh, happy. So we'll take a quick five minute stretch break. And then uh, we'll get into the second half of the evening and I'll let Nate take over uh, kind of getting into in, uh, identifying and mapping your property. And then he'll uh, wrap up with a case study 
and an overview of a checklist uh, through a guided activity. Uh, so tonight's homework, um, again, just keep this in mind. Uh, so we'll be elaborating on that, deep, that um, rough sketch that we did after session one and, and going through that checklist and inventory that we introduced tonight. So with that, um, I just wanted to kind of start a discussion about the homework. Um, I hope this is useful to everyone. Uh, I think these kind of got it, these activities are, are fun and uh, they help us to, to kind of keep, keep the concepts fresh in between sessions and I hope everyone else kind of feels the same way. Um, so how did we do? Uh, did, did anyone's ideas of, of land stewardship change at all? And, and if so, how? Uh, feel free to, to answer any of these questions in the chat box or, or raise your hand if anyone wants to speak to any of these questions specifically. But um, did anyone come up with any new ideas that you hadn't considered before after hearing uh, both Julie or, or Michelle's uh, presentations last week? And more specifically to the map, uh, did anyone have any difficulties with, with sketching out or mapping your property? Um, I know a number of us probably did it just on pen, with pen and paper, um, while others might have gone a little more uh, in depth and, uh, and and done some things on the computer. So I, I know there's a good mix out there, but if there was any difficulties with that or anyone came to any realizations, feel free to type that in the chat box. We have a couple of responses coming in, Sean. Um, Someone said planting more trees, um, micro meadow creation by stop stopping mowing. Great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, living fences. Excellent. Great thoughts. So yeah, feel free to keep um, populating that chat box with, with anything that you might have um, might have discovered through that process that you think is useful to the group. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we thought it would be useful to, to hear from some of you. Uh, so a, a few of the attendees have gotten back to me uh, in an email saying that they'd be, they'd be willing to, to share their homework and their sketches. So um, we'll, we'll start out with, with Susan. Let's see if I can make this work here and, and, and allow Susan to talk here. Let's see. All right. I, Susan, can I, you hear us? I, I, I tapped on mute. I yep, can hear I can, you. Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. So I should start then. <clears throat> sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay. This is the diagram that I made of our lot on which we live. And we have been living here for 47 years. We, we bought the land 47 years ago. And when we did buy it, even there's a lot of woodland now, but it was really even more wooded at that time within that center area where you see all the writing was more of an open field. And we um, targeted a knoll. You, the house is just very, very tiny as you can see with the walkway down to the driveway. And on, it is situated on a knoll, which in the end was a good decision because we have no water in the basement problems. Um, <clears throat> over the years, oh, for about the first 30 to 35 years, well, we've never had an overarching plan, but for those first 30 years, we only, the only work we did was to establish a vegetable garden, which does have a fence around it for keeping deer out, and so far that has been successful. Um, our overarching goals were only to keep as much of the woodland as we could and to use as few chemicals as is possible. I would say it's only within the last 15 years that we've worked to uh, learn more about um, species, and now I'm having a brain fade, um, species that we don't want on the property, such as autumn olive, which is in front of the house and last spring we did have it cut down because it is an invasive, that's the word I wanted, an invasive species that is um, something that is important to eradicate and it had seeded itself all along the, the um, roadside so we've been working to eradicate that and I know last week there was discussion about um, garlic mustard and that's another thing that has been in the woods and what I do fairly regularly every year is weed the woods to rid as much garlic mustard away as we can. Um, I think the assignment asked just to talk about 
you can probably see from my chart here that we're, we're circled with woodland. And over the years, we pushed back, um, back by cutting down trees on the perimeter, we have opened up more space, mainly because we realized that over 35 years, trees actually grow. <laughs> And they were blocking the sunlight from the garden, so we weren't getting our six hours of sun. So we pushed back that um, that delineation of where the woodland started to give us more of an openness in the center. And the hardest part now is to discipline ourselves not to mow the field south of the garden and to try to establish a meadow. <laughs> so that's one of the things that we're starting to work on. Great. So I think, I don't know if there's anything more I, sh I should share. We. Uh, well, that's great, Susan. Um, it seems like you actually, you, you put in a pretty good amount of detail on your first map here and you've, 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 you've done some thinking about this already. So uh, that's great. We're glad to see that. Um, there, we'll have some time later on in the, uh, in the evening for, for questions too. So if anyone has any questions for Susan, uh, for Susan, please feel free to write them in the chat box and uh, we'll, we'll, We'll pass those along to her. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, so next, uh, we'll hear from Chris. Chris, let me just make you. Uh, all right. Chris, can you hear me okay there? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. How are you? All right. So um, <clears throat> uh, Chris Drago here, live in the town of Stanford. Um, have been in our property for uh, just about two and a half years now, uh, rented for about a year and then bought in our second year. And um, in the last year or so, learned about the, the parcel map, which uh, is, is there on the left, which um, we find very interesting and useful. Um, so that's the um, elevation view um, on the left. You can see in the um, right-hand corner um, where our house is, and then we have a, a barn and then a running shed out in the in the field, which is um, if you look on the right, that's the uh, the the red the red square. Um, but based on the elevation, we're the house is in a, in a bit of a the bottom of a, a bowl, so um, drainage um, is something that we've had to pay attention to, especially um, you know in the in the basement and needing to do some grading there. So when we bought the house, there are a number of um, trees right up against the the house. If you look to the right. Um, the driveway now you can see is to the left. Originally it was to the right. So the whole property, the living part of the property was really in that, in that lower, in that upper right hand corner. I should say that the whole property was put into um, Dutchess Land Conservancy uh, protection a number of years ago. Um, a number of properties in our area are protected by the DLC. When I was buying the property, um, got up to speed on what that means and what um, I, as a steward of, uh, of this land and the area, would need to do um, once, I, once I bought the property. And it's something that I like to pay attention to and think about when we're doing work. So, um, but we have done a lot of work in the first uh, year, year and a half while we've lived here. Uh, as I mentioned, moving the driveway to the left. Um, and, and then um, there was a security fence along the road. You can see where the house is right up here against the road there. Uh, we removed the security fence and put a living fence in with um, some, you know, various shrubs um, and trees um, to shield us from the road. Um, and then we did some grading work just behind the house to open up, us up in the view to the um, open field, which is behind us, which um, at one point was a horse pasture. Now I'm actually sitting outside looking at it um, and um, there's quite a bit of hay sitting there and trying to decide what to do with that. And then we have some transition points between um, the grass area around the property um, into the field and then um, into the wooded area. So um, one of the things we're thinking about next, um, since we, now we've sort of done a lot of the work around the main house, um, you know, looking at how do we um, work on some of the transitions into the meadow and into the woods, um, but at the same time being supportive of, um, of the land. Great, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, we have one question. Um, what program was used to make the overlay that you did over here on the right right side? Did you do that in any specific program or? So, so my, my partner, Eric, is um, in, in, knows graphic design um, and he's running late. He was out at a, a, 
uh, work project today and uh, he will be back at seven. So once he comes back, I will ask him um, which program it was, but uh, he is the master of, of, of this work. I'm just happy to represent it. <laughs> okay, uh, great, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, actually, there was a question for Susan too. So let me just real quick, I'll allow her to talk here. Uh, let's see. Are you, yes. Yeah, so Susan, there was a question. Um, what happens as the meadow goes? How do you manage it? Uh, how, what happens as the meadow goes? Grows? Yeah, a question from David. I, you know, maybe. How do I manage it? Yeah. Um, I'll have to say that we haven't put a whole lot of thought in how to manage it. It's just there. <laughs> what I want to do is add more native species. One goal is to add Joe pie weed. We do have some milkweed in there, and it is not a large, it is not a large meadow at all. But I guess you might call it is a transition from the vegetable garden and blueberry bush row to the woods. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have native. Well, they hayseed ferns are also in this meadow area which were there under the in the at the edge of the woods before we push the woods back and i learned that as long as they still have wet feet which they do in that area they will live in the sun but i i guess i don't know how else to answer the question other than we just kind of roll with the flow as we go <laughs> Okay. Great, Susan. Thank you very much. And again, if there's any questions for either Susan or, or Chris as we go along, feel free and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll allow them to, <laughs> to, to try to uh, trip back in here. So thank you both. Um, we had one more person. Uh, I'm not sure if Brittany is on. I don't see her name in the attendees list here. Uh, Brittany, if you're, if you're here and you're under a different name. Oh, let's see. Someone raised her hand. Uh, here we go. Brittany, is that you? Hi, uh, yes. Great. So, uh, yeah, my husband Wesley and I moved into this house in 2017. Um, the whole property was mostly grass and we've been kind of picking small projects and working on them year by year. So we have um, kind of a swamp in the backyard that I've been trying to manicure and make more naturalized with natives. Uh, we put in a meadow in kind of that boot print area in yellow. And then this year I've been working on uh, planting a thicket in the front corner of the property where we had a, a black walnut fall last year. So um, that walnut coming down kind of exposed a pretty rugged area and uh, gave us another thing to focus on. So on the next slide, um, these are my various drawings. <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, grow sketch in notebook. And then I like to play with PowerPoint and try and, you know, we got drone images taken of the property, which was really helpful. But um, this just gives you a top-down view, aerial view to see, you know, what the canopy of the trees are, um, and planning where things can go. So the, the hackberry, the cranberry, viburnum, serviceberry, those are all new in this area. And the existing trees I tried to put in as well. <laughs> um, and then I found a software online. Um, the URL is there on the right-hand side, gardena.com. Um, it's a subsidiary of Husqvarna, I guess. Um, but they have a free online uh, tool that I've been playing around with to try and map things. Um, so, yeah, this is our project for this year. And we put in a couple of big plants and shrubs and some smaller plants and focusing mainly on uh, natives. And there was a question about how to manage the meadows. Um, we did an experiment this year on ours where we, you know, mowed one very short um, to the, not to the ground, but as low as our mower deck would go. And uh, on the other one, we just, you know, mowed around the obvious perennials that were coming up. So 
Uh, we've been trying to manage mugwort in those meadows and things like that that are sneaking in. Um, it was seeded with a native seed mix, but. Yeah, so for the meadow, we actually took up the sod in 2018 and just planted all native grasses and, um, and forbs then. So um, it looked bad the first year. <laughs> There was something last year. This year it's going to look even better. So it takes a little while. But yeah, the graphing and charting, um, the online software is pretty handy and PowerPoint works too. So that's it. Great. Uh, well, uh, Brittany and, and, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your your feedback here and sharing your presentation. Uh, Brittany, if it's possible, maybe you could share that link in the chat box so that others who might be interested could, could take a look at it and get it sure. more. Great. All right. Well, we appreciate it. And um, hopefully it was useful for everybody. Uh, again, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll have, a, we'll have some time uh, later on and we can open it up again for, for a little more conversation. So um, I wanted to kind of start off the content of tonight uh, with an introduction to inventories, um, what they are, why they're important, and you know how these can be, be meaningful to to you all in the different roles that you play. Uh, you know we have a number of CAC members in here. Um, a number of you are our CAC members and landowners. And uh, again, there's 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 different applications for these inventories on on a wide range of scales. Um, so. I kind of just wanted to to start it off with 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 that and and you know going going from a large scale um, you know we we can see some of our counties have natural resource inventories or NRIs um, Dutchess County is uh, completed one in 2010 and um, hopefully in the process of updating that here in the next year or two um, some of our communities uh, this is a natural resource inventory from the city of Poughkeepsie that was completed last year. Uh, so as, as a number of you are CECs, these are great tools for your communities to, to inventory your assets, your, your natural resources, your, what's important to your communities. Um, and and they're, they're great tools for, for local decision making as well. For those of you who are um, just landowners and you, and you want to manage your land on a small scale, um, there's inventories that, you know, there's tons of different templates uh, for that as well. I mean, Seems like a number of you have really put some thought into this already, which is great. Um, we we would love to see that. Um, and but we just wanted to mention, uh, and Nate will be kind of going through this checklist that we have on the right here a little bit later, uh, and it'll be part of the homework. But there's there's tons of um, templates and and worksheets uh, or checklists out there that you can use to, to inventory what you have. So again, just, just to kind of stress the point that, you know, lo small local management decisions can really help inform larger municipal decisions and, and even up to the legislation. So um, what, what you're doing on your, on your land on a small scale is, is important. Um, and at a personal level, uh, starting with these inventories are, are useful in that they allow you to kind of know your baseline, right? They let you know what you're starting with and you can use that as a basis for tracking your progress as you go along. Uh, they can be as thorough or detailed as you want, and um, and and again, we encourage you to be as thorough or, or detailed as you can. As especially uh, tonight, after following tonight, when we get into a little more detail and you add more detail to your maps and, and these checklists, so um, hopefully you'll be armed with a little more knowledge of, of how to go about doing that. Uh, and lastly, just wanted to mention, you know, prioritization. We're going to kind of keep harping on this throughout this the next two sessions. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of us have, we realize we have a ton of, of management goals and, and potential projects uh, at the ready, uh, but, but really prioritizing those and, 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 discuss, and figuring out which ones are feasible and, and easy to do uh, earlier on and prioritizing them is, is definitely key. So uh, I wanted to get into uh, an overview of some of the mapping tools and resources available to all of us. Um, I realize there are a number of people on, on this webinar who are not Dutchess County residents. So um, we'll, we'll try to cover a diverse um, range of tools here. Um, I will go over some of the Dutchess County specific tools, but hopefully won't spend too much time on that. Um, 
There are a number of parcel mapper tools for other counties. So if you're not a Dutchess County resident, I would highly encourage you to explore your options for that. Um, if you haven't already, I know, um, you know Ulster County has uh, um, a parcel mapping tool. I don't, I'm not sure if it has the same kind of utilities that, that the Dutchess County tool has, but I, and again, I know there are a number of other counties that have similar um, resources. Uh, I'll give that overview and then I'll transition it over to Nate and let him give you uh, a rundown of the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper, a great tool that is uh, focused on mostly the Hudson Valley, um, but does touch on uh, other parts of the state and surrounding areas too. So give a good overview of that. And then we won't spend a lot of time on it tonight, but I did just want to mention uh, some other tools that might be useful. Um, you know, IMAP invasives, maybe I think Joyce might touch on that a little bit in the next session, uh, or, or, or other tools uh, or applications like eBird that allows you to map, you know, where you've, where you've spotted specific birds. So some other, other tools and resources out there worth mentioning. So with that, um, before I get into the Dutchess County tools, I just wanted to throw a poll out there and see how familiar you all were with some of these, just to kind of take a temperature. So um, please uh, take, take a minute to respond to these polls. Again, remember you have to scroll down on the right uh, to end polling there. So the first question, have you ever used uh, Dutchess County parcel access and or aerial access before? And the second question, have you ever used the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper? So take a minute to respond to that if you don't mind. All right, just another second here. All right. So, okay, for Dutchess County tools, it looks like there are some people who are somewhat familiar with it. Um, that's good. So hopefully some of this should be an overview. Um, there are a number of you who haven't, so that's, that's great too. Uh, and looking down at the, um, I'm sorry, there we go, let me share that. Uh, and looking down at the, the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper, it looks like we have a lot of people who are not that familiar with it. Great. So Nate will give a good overview of that uh, a little, you know, just a little bit here. Uh, so, so stay tuned. Hopefully both of these, um, these tools will be useful. All right. All right, so first I just wanted to um, introduce the Dutchess County GIS portal. Uh, for anyone in Dutchess County who is not familiar with this, um, you can get to it directly from the duchessnewyork.gov, uh, the, the county website, um, or I have the direct link down here. Uh, it's also on the landing page for anyone who needs to find it easier. Um, there you can find a number of their GIS applications. They have their new parks and trails application, which is pretty, pretty sharp. Um, and then also parcel access, which we'll get into here and, and some others. So. so for anyone who's not familiar with parcel access, um, this is uh, again, specific to Dutchess County. Um, it, it, it's, it's a great tool. Uh, it, it's got a lot of information pertaining to um, you know, parcel information, but there's also some really uh, useful, a few useful base layers such as flood areas and wetlands, uh, and a cool, uh, a few cool tools that allow you to do some measurement, which is which is also useful. Uh, so to get started, you, you you use the search function up here in the uh, top right, and you can search by either the parcel lot number, uh, an owner name, or uh, a specific address for a parcel. Uh, and so for the sake of um, an exercise here, I decided to zoom in and take a look at the uh, Thompson Pond Preserve up in Pine Plains. Uh, and I know this is owned by the Nature Conservancy, so I typed that into the owner um, name here and got a number of results. And I selected the specific one there and it zoomed me into uh, the parcel that I needed here. So there we can see the parcel of interest in the middle, um, and then we have a nice ribbon on the right here that has some more specific parcel information. Uh, we can see the, the number, the address, owner name, uh, lot size, an acreage, uh, land use code, uh, whether or not it's in an agricultural district, uh, and then we also can, can choose to see the full property card and, and get some, glean some more information from that. 
Uh, you have two base map options. Uh, we were just looking at the uh, satellite imagery, but we can also toggle on up here in the uh, top right or top left rather, uh, the terrain based lap map, and we can see uh, a nice hill shade layer with with contours, which could be really useful uh, for, for planning purposes if, if, if you're um, considering steep slopes or um, you know drainage. You can also see the streams layer much more clearly as well. So speaking of streams, um, up here, again, in this ribbon here where we can control everything, we have uh, a flood areas layer that we can toggle on. Uh, so we can see the, the FEMA floodplain uh, and flood zone. Um, we have our legend here that pops up showing us whether we're in uh, the, you know, the 0.2%, uh, also known as the 500 year flood zone, uh, or, or these other flood areas which are usually, I think all three of these pertain to the 1% the or 100 year floodplain. So there's also more information if you click this link, it'll tell you what those different zones are. The second um, useful layer that we have, base layer that we have is the wetlands layer. And again, we can control that through the map components uh, tab up here and, and toggling, toggling on wetlands. Uh, and here we can see both the uh, New York State Department of Envir Environmental Conservation, uh, wetlands which are regulatory and the federal or NWI wetlands which are non-regulatory. Um, and, and I'll let Nate get into a little further detail about those in his presentation, but just wanted to show you that both those layers are available uh, through parcel access. Another great tool um, that's, that's, that's um, available through parcel access is, is this measure tool, uh, again up in the top, uh, top bar here. And it allows you to measure distance in either uh, linear, you know, linear distance or uh, measure area in, in acreage or square feet. So uh, just for this exercise here, I, I drew a polygon around the emergent marsh section of this parcel. And over here in the right side, it pops up with uh, area and perimeter. Again, you can see it's about a 15 acre uh, marsh. Um, and, you know, it's got about three quarters of a mile uh, perimeter around it. So this can be useful on your own property if you need to um, you know, measure a water body or a forest patch and, uh, and you know, having measurements might be useful. So that, that's, that's a great tool. Uh, and then again, the, the linear measurement tool here, um, again, clicking on it up here in the top bar and uh, dropping segment points here to, to create a linear measurement. And the, the, the neat thing about this is it gives you each segment's length uh, and then it also tolls it for you. So uh, this could be useful if you had, you know, a repairing corridor that you were uh, interested in planting um, shrubs or trees in and you, and you needed to measure, you know, that linear distance. So it's another useful tool that I encourage you to explore a little bit. So lastly, um, I wanted to introduce aerial access for anyone who's not familiar with that. And you can get to aerial access directly through parcel access. Over here on the right side, we have a link that'll take you uh, to the other application. And if you have a, a parcel selected, it'll take you, it'll zoom you in right to that extent, which is pretty, pretty neat. So uh, for anyone who's not familiar with this tool, um, it's, it, it allows you to, to take two years of satellite imagery and to use a slider bar to kind of pan back and forth. And this can be useful to, to see, um, you know, land, uh, how land use or land cover has changed. You know, Julie really stressed the importance of understanding the history of our land, and, and this is a great tool for it. Um, so again, looking at the parcel here in particular, uh, I thought one neat example here was in 1936, we, uh, we could see that this bay over here had some uh, a pretty expansive amount of open water uh, and then in 2016, um, it, it's filled in quite considerably with uh, emergent vegetation, uh, I'm assuming uh, Phragmites, uh, so we can see the outline of it from, from 36. So anyway, just a neat, a neat comparison. Um, and then another comparison with uh, a little more recent year in, in 2000, uh, we can see this is Thompson Pond up in High Plains again. Uh, we can see that when this photo was taken in 2000, there were some some algal blooms. Uh, and then in uh, 2016, we can also see that there's another little islet here of vegetation that formed uh, just within 16 years. So 
again, a great tool for, for, for comparing land change uh, over, over a period of years. So with that, um, I'm gonna transition and transfer it over to Nate, but if there's any questions, I, I know that was a real quick run through. Um, I, I think a number of you have probably used the tool, but if, if there's anyone who hasn't used parcel access and, and wants a little more information or could uh, use some uh, better guidance on that, please uh, reach out to me one-on-one -on -one via email uh, or throw any questions out in the chat box that we'll, we'll try to answer at some point. Um, and Sean, while we're waiting to see if anyone has questions, um, there was a response uh, at the beginning that of what, you know, participants learned last session, um, poison ivy is a native, and then, oh, sorry, that's my dog. Um, um, all right, I'm going to mute myself. Okay, no problem. Well, thank you all for the responses. Um, we're trying to yeah, manage the chat box and, and present at the same time here too. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'll take a look at those as I transfer it over to Nate here and, and try to uh, mention some comments. So, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Nate Nardi Cyrus. Nate is the uh, conservation and land use specialist for the Hudson River Estuary Program in Cornell University. And Nate's gonna give us uh, a little better overview of the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper. Um, again, it seems like this is a tool that some of you are a little less familiar with, so hopefully uh, this is uh, some, some great new information for you all. So I'll pass it over to Nate with that. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, everyone can see my screen okay and hear me? Fantastic, okay. Well, um, like I said, thanks to Sean. Uh, my name is Nate Nardi Cyrus. I'm a conservation and land use specialist at the uh, DEC Hudson River Estuary Program in partnership with uh, Cornell University. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper. Um, it's great to see that so many people uh, haven't been exposed to this because I think this is a, a really useful tool. Uh, we generally kind of present this to municipal audiences, CACs, um, those folks, but I find that during these trainings, they always go to their property anyway and don't pay attention to anything that we say. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to check out your own property uh, with this mapper. Uh, before I get into some of the specifics, uh, if you're not familiar with the estuary program, uh, it's a uniquely non-regulatory program of the New York State DUVC uh, that works to achieve uh, the following six key benefits through grants, research, education, conservation, restoration, and community planning assistance. I generally help out in the community planning assistance arena, um, but I'm really excited to be presenting today because prior to coming to the estuary program, um, I did uh, ecological restoration for scenic Hudson uh, for about five years. Um, and so I learned quite a bit there and uh, show you a little bit of that later on in the presentation. So the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper uh, has 30 plus geographic data sets um, you'll find that it's really similar to the Environmental Resource Mapper, um, which is another DEC mapper. Superficially, they look very similar, um, but the Environmental Resource Mapper is a regulatory tool, a screening tool, whereas the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper is a planning tool. And that's, that's just what we're doing today, we're planning. Um, and you can see here below is the, uh, the link to the landing page. Uh, if Sean, if you don't mind posting this um, now, or you can access it when we uh, give PDF copies of the presentation. And I'll go over these data sets in as much detail as I have time to do. So once you arrive on the landing page, you'll see um, quite a bit of information. You can launch the application directly uh, right there, but you'll also notice that in this box here, uh, there's updates to the layer. We're regularly uh, updating the mapper with new resources. Here you can see uh, our newly uh, published forest condition index in core forest layers. Uh, I'll talk about those in greater detail, but check out those spots for updates. We also have a fact sheet that's a useful quick reference, um, as well as a, a webinar recording. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to get into a lot of the nitty gritty of the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper, um, but this link will bring you um, to that webinar and you can take your time and kind of understanding how this works and maybe troubleshoot some problems if you have. 
Okay, so if you were to actually click on that link right up at the top, it'll take you to this screen. And if I zoom in on this box, you first have to click through. Um, it's really just explaining that this is a non-regulatory tool, first of all, and that doesn't usually affect most people here. Um, however, it's also the data is created at, at, at a certain scale. We were talking about scales before. And a lot of this data was created um, at the regional, um, some at the national level, um, at least at the state level. Uh, so it's important to understand that the accuracy of this data is, it's not perfect. Uh, and this is really just kind of a screening tool for you to understand, um, you know, potential resources that might be on your property. All right. So there's also uh, instructions on how to use the map right in this, uh, on this box. If you click on it, you'll get a PDF that you can scroll through with some helpful FAQs. Uh, and you'll find on the mapper that help is never far so here we are, uh, we're in the, the interface of the mapper here. And the first thing that you wanna do uh, is to click on this box up in the kind of upper central part of the screen. That'll move you to full screen. Uh, especially these days we have a kind of, there's a standard COVID related banner that's at the top of the pages. Um, this will collapse that banner and you'll get the full use of the screen. So it's really useful for um, zoom in and you can use that also have here this, all of the layers are in these kind of accordion tabs on the side. So if you were to click on say search or tools, that would open up a larger window. Um, this is a good opportunity to say that uh, this, that the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper has a lot of the same sort of capabilities that the Duchess Parcel Access has. I'm not gonna go into it, but if you were to click on tools, you should be able to uh, use the measure tool um, you should be able to search for a location using this search box. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And if you want more information, again, we'll provide links to that webinar. You can zoom in a pretty standard way here. And also there's more instructions. Like I said, help is never far ahead. You'll notice next to the instructions, there's a, a kind of a base map area here you can toggle through. Um, much like the parcel access, there's topographic, there's uh, some aerial photos. It doesn't get into a lot of uh, detail. There's only a few kind of options, but that'll be helpful in creating your map. All right, so the first tab at the very bottom, you'll see this reference layer. This will be really useful. Um, you can click on and off municipal boundaries, county boundaries, um, as well as parcels. It's not going to be necessarily as accurate as uh, the Dutchess County parcel access, but for those that are outside of Dutchess County, um, as well as those that are in, uh, this is a good reference to at least orient yourself uh, to where you are. Uh, we also have New York protected areas here, so you can see if you live next to a known protected area. Um, this is by no means a comprehensive database of all protected areas in the state, so you can hold <laughs> um, Hold off on sending me emails if, if you don't see a property you know is protected, um, especially in Dutchess County because uh, Dutchess Land Conservancy likes to respect the privacy of their landowners that have easements. So a lot of their portfolio is absent from this data set. Um, that being said, it's always good to know where protected lands are, are close by. Okay, I'm not gonna talk too much about the estuary layers, but they're very cool. Um, if you live adjacent to the estuary, um, on the river somewhere, congratulations, first of all. Um, but uh, second, there's a lot of great information. We have tidal wetlands um, that were mapped by uh, the Hudson River Estuary and Research Reserve, submerged aquatic vegetation mapping that, that came out of uh, the Research Reserve and Cary, uh, as well as migratory fish runs. These are actually might be of some interest to the folks. Uh, they're actually due, if you click on this layer, you'll see exactly what migratory fish were recorded and most of those are very close to the Hudson, but you'll notice uh, it goes way up into the estuary as far away as, um, you know, deep into the highlands and into, uh, I'm not sure, as far out as Unionvale. Um, this is American eel, uh, which is a, just a really interesting fish uh, born out in the Bermuda Triangle area of the Atlantic Ocean and migrate up into freshwater streams to spend um, you know, up to 20 years of their life before going back to spawn and die. 
So it's pretty neat that these guys can get way up into the estuary uh, and you can see where DEC records have found them close by. Um, and then significant coastal fish and wildlife habitry, uh, habitats and bathymetry, which is um, just what the river bottom looks like. This might be a little bit more interesting to folks. Uh, we have watershed boundaries, which I'll go into a little bit more. Biomonitoring data uh, is, a, is a metric of uh, water quality. I won't get into that, but it can help you understand the quality of some of the major streams in your area. Uh, we have DC stream classifications that gets to regulatory significance. So not necessarily an indicator of quality, but of how the DEC is, is regulating streams. Um, and they do regulate uh, certain streams, those classifications of C with some kind of trout presence um, and higher are, are regulated, the bed and banks, those streams. Um, so you can at least get some kind of idea of how your stream is being regulated and whether or not there is habitat for a trout or trout spawning. Um, and the priority water bodies list uh, relates to that in, in regulation and water quality. Uh, I'm not going to get into dams and, and road stream crossings, uh, which in this case is usually referring to culverts, um, but it is really important. And if you do know of culverts uh, on your property that pass, uh, you know, moderately sized streams, uh, making sure that those uh, culverts are passable for wildlife or bridges are passable for wildlife, um, both aquatic and terrestrial, so brook trout, American eel, um, but also things like mink can kind of use the riverbanks uh, adjacent to streams. Uh, it might be something that you want to inventory on your property. Uh, if you have a dam, you definitely want to note that. Uh, and then we have the stream condition index. I'll get into that and, and some of the flood zones. It's a lot to get, go over. Okay, Sean, can you uh, queue up this poll here? Just get, get us started. So the first thing we wanted to ask, oh, this is a different poll, but that's okay. <laughs> Keep me on my toes. Um, so yeah, uh, if you remember what Sean was talking about earlier in the presentation, uh, are you gonna relaunch, Sean? Oops, sorry, go ahead. You can do the watersheds poll, Nate. I'm sorry about that. I, I, uh, just ask to type into the chat box. Uh, okay, just ask people to type in. Yeah, okay. Um, so we just wanna know what watershed that you all are in. Um, uh, if you're in Dutchess County, there's a good chance that you are in the uh, Wappingers Creek watershed or the direct drainage of the Hudson, maybe the Sawkill, maybe the Fishkill Creek or the 10 Mile River. So uh, if you know, uh, please type it into the chat box. Uh, if you're from outside of the county, that's great. We'd love to hear that too. Uh, and if you don't know, uh, type in the chat box. We'll just give people a few minutes to kind of let us know which watershed they, they reside in. Great. Lots of people getting, giving some responses. Glad to see yeah, awareness there. I see the who's a tonic in there. I'm a, uh, you know, that's my natal watershed. So <laughs> on the Connecticut side. Great. A lot of Wappingers Creek, Sprout Creek, awesome. So everyone understands that, you know, every, everywhere is in a watershed of some kind. Uh, likely, uh, if, unless you're in the 10 mile watershed, it's likely that your watershed leads to the Hudson River. Um, if you're in the 10 mile, that's gonna go out to the Houstonic uh, in, by way of Connecticut. Uh, but this helpful feature here, uh, this first layer, let's see if I can click through it. So this will let you know uh, what watershed you are uh, at the Huck 10, uh, the Huck 12, and the Huck 8 levels. And so Huck is just a, an acronym for hydrologic unit code. You don't have to really know that. All you have to know is that Huck 12 is the smallest one that we have here. And so the example I have is this is out of Westchester County. Um, in the Croton, you can see Bailey Brook, Croton River, that's the name of this watershed. Um, and you can also get some metrics on how much of that watershed is impervious cover, so things like roads and, and structures, uh, and how much of that is forest cover. 
And that can give you sort of a general metric of uh, how healthy your watershed is um, and, and kind of a proxy for water quality within those streams. It's not a perfect metric, but um, some cool information you can pull out of the mapper. Uh, the other great tool um, is the Stream Condition Index. And this is a product uh, created by our program um, that's modeled using uh, an, an EPA uh, methodology and it really takes into account uh, the land use patterns, um, you know, how much forest is on the landscape and natural lands versus impervious surface. Um, it also takes into account some of the uh, in-stream habitat features, whether there are barriers like dams. Um, there's quite a few metrics and if you click on any of these little segments, you will uh, get the kind of breakdown of what contributed to that score. Uh, I'm showing you this because you can really get an idea of how healthy your little stream segment is. Uh, and this covers much more stream area than any of the DEC regulatory uh, mapping does. So while you might be able to see stuff about stream, about trout, um, in this case, uh, this can actually give you an idea of what, you know, your predicted stream quality is. Uh, and that can be useful. So a little bit of a... A focus, this is a parcel in Dutchess County and I pulled up, you can see the boundaries here. Uh, I wish there was a different color, but um, this line that I'm kind of tracing with my cursor right now, the darker orange line, that's a, what's, what's been uh, predicted as a low condition stream. And you can see it kind of meanders its way uh, on this side of this open field uh, and down and out. And so uh, if you, this is a good opportunity to um, show the riparian buffer areas uh, so this is a tool that is it's essentially modeling out the 50-year floodplain uh, or uh, and adjacent wetlands. Uh, so it, this is an area that's smaller than the FEMA floodplain mapping um, and more directly tied to the health of the stream. Uh, this layer was created by the New York Natural Heritage Program uh, for DEC uh, Trees for Trips to help prioritize some of the areas for restoration. So this is a perfect tool for a landowner looking for an area to uh, reforest. Uh, you can see back here that kind of lower section of the field right here. Looks like that's a great candidate. Even this area shows kind of darker coloration, which seems like there might be some tanning water there early in the year. Um, so anyway, this can be a great tool for, for figuring out where you might want to reforest. Likewise, we have uh, the FEMA flood data in here, uh, and I just want to use this as an opportunity to show FEMA, they, they show the 100 and 500 year storms or 1% or 0.2. Um, I think it's better to, to look at the uh, uh, annual percent chance, which that 1% and 0.2% chance. Um, but you can see here the areas that are covered when I overlay the riparian buffer areas, it covers a lot more area. There's just more streams that it's being modeled off of. So you're more likely to have an area that shows up in this than in the FEMA data. Both are useful, of course. All right, so as I get into the wetlands here, we're looking at state regulated wetlands, a national wetlands inventory, like what Sean had shown, and then this great tool, probable and possible wetland areas. Uh, and that comes from soil drain. So here we have just kind of a bird's eye view of the state regu uh, regulated freshwater wetlands. Uh, these wetlands have to be uh, generally larger than 12.4 acres in size uh, to actually gain regulatory status in New York State. So this is by no means all of the wetlands in uh, Newcastle, New York, uh, but it is some of the larger ones. Uh, and you'll see this kind of halo around them. That's the uh, 500 foot check zone because these maps are so inaccurate. Um, that's kind of allows them some regulatory leeway to, to remap them uh, when they go out on site. Uh, so we wouldn't really recommend using this other than if you plan activity, know if you are in uh, one of these areas because you will require a permit from DEC uh, for some regulated activities. The National Wetlands Inventory is much more uh, thorough. You'll see a lot uh, more smaller wetlands on this, and, and this will be a great resource for most folks. You also see on this left-hand side here, uh, there's some breakout of the type of wetland. So a freshwater forested shrub wetland, that would also be another name for a swamp. Um, a freshwater emerging wetland, that could be a cattail marsh or a reed bed, 
uh, something like that. So you're getting a little bit finer of a picture of where wetlands are. If we zoom in even further at more of a parcel scale, uh, you can see that National Wetlands Inventory Mapping, um, I do want to reiterate this is non-regulatory. When you hear of you know, federally regulated wetlands, this is not by any means a list of them. This was created by the, uh, uh, the Fed for, for mapping primarily for wildlife purposes. So uh, you can also see this wetland soil, probable wetland areas, and possible wetland areas. So this was derived from county soil maps. Uh, it's not really, it's only accurate to a scale of uh, two acres, so it's pretty inaccurate, but it will identify areas that uh, the NWI won't pick up National Wetlands Inventory or the state regulated. Uh, so it's again kind of a flag saying, hey, you should check this area out and you might have some small wetlands, uh, even though they're not mapped. And you can click on that and get more information on, on that soil class if you, if you really want to uh, nerd out on soils. I'm looking at you. All right, <laughs> so we also have forests. This is uh, a great resource for forest data, the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper. Uh, the forest, forest Condition Index, we'll go over in a second. Um, core forest are areas that are uh, important for uh, certain interior uh, breeding songbirds and just animals that require deep interior forests. You'll see this graphic here. Um, this is demonstrating uh, phenomenon called fragmentation where you pretend that there's a road that's gone in through this formerly intact forest. Uh, it creates more of what's called edge habitat and less of what's called core forest. Um, and so we actually have mapped areas that are far enough away from the edge that they're considered core forest. Um, and you really want to uh, keep active sort of management uh, out of these areas. Um, when I say management, I more mean development. Um, but you want to really keep disturbance to a limited uh, degree in these areas. And then we'll talk, we won't talk about the Nature Conservancy forest data, but that includes matrix forests and linkage zones. And these are uh, mapped across the entire Northeast region, kind of the highest priority, most healthy intact forests, that would, would be the matrix forests. And then the linkage zones are the areas that connect them. So if you fall in one of these forests, uh, you know, it's likely that your forest is contributing to um, larger species migration in the face of climate change or just general health of populations that can move back and forth between large forest patches. So back to our example here in Dutchess County, clearly there's a large forest uh, in the eastern part of this parcel along with this field here. I'm going to click on the forest condition index. Uh, and I know that blue is a really good color, uh, <laughs> means that it's a very uh, important forest. Uh, this data was, was mapped using a percentile system. So uh, all the forests in the, in the Hudson River estuary watershed in some of the immediate areas, they were given a value and, so, and then compared against each other. So um, some of the top 1% forests would be places in the Catskills, the Hudson Highlands, um, some parts of the Taconics, uh, and then it goes down from there. So if you click on an area, you can see the exact percentile. So this forest is in, in almost in the 95th percentile of Hudson Valley Forest, so really exemplary uh, quality forest. And what's really even more cool is when you get these higher value forests, there's these notable rankings. Uh, and here you can see this forest patch is in the top 5% for local connectedness and stream quality. And so I just think back to, you know, we were just looking at the stream condition index and we saw um, sort of a lower quality stream running through here. Well, uh, you see this field, there's a possibility that, you know, reforestation of this area down here could contribute to some of the reasons why this forest is as important as it is. So again, a lot of the value of this mapper is really just contextualizing your and knowing that, hey, I could do all kinds of other stuff on my property, but if I plant trees down in the corner here, um, I could be really contributing to something much larger than myself. And I just want to end on that with, you can see this blue kind of medium blue color through here, our par parcel is right there. You don't necessarily think of your parcel as, you know, being more than just your boundaries and maybe some of the, your immediate neighbors. Um, but by protecting those areas, you really are enhancing kind of larger systems in which wildlife 
uh, tends to create a little more chaos. All right, hope I'm having time, but <laughs> I'll breeze through biodiversity. Um, we have significant biodiversity areas, which I'll talk about. I won't touch on Audubon important bird areas. Um, they are important. Uh, and if you uh, click on them, again, a lot of these uh, layers are clickable. So if you click on them on the map, it'll bring you to a link that'll take you to uh, Audubon's website and, and, and the website for a specific important bird area. And they'll tell you exactly why that area is important. So it may be an important area for grassland breeding, breeding birds. And so you'll, you can figure that out. Um, there's also known important areas and significant communities, which we'll go over very quickly. Uh, so we have significant biodiversity areas. These were uh, identified in the Wildlife and Habitat Conservation Framework for the Hudson River Estuary. Uh, it's a great read. It's getting a little old now, but uh, always good information. Uh, Dutchess County has quite a few of these areas. There's the Dutchess County wetlands in the middle portion. The Hudson River is an important biodiversity area. Uh, we have the highlands, the Harlem Valley calcareous wetlands, and the Taconics. And in, you can link to this document if you click on the layer, uh, and there's just amazing resources that they just describe why these areas are so important. And it's not specific to your property, but it can really help you understand the context in which you're living. Uh, all right, we also have uh, relatively new important areas and rare communities, data set, uh, important areas. You can see are broken down into a number of different uh, subcategories. These were created using models that take actual known rare species occurrences that the New York Natural Heritage Program has documented. So they found, you know, a, uh, a rare snake, a rattlesnake, let's say, in a site. And then they took that area and then figured out what its habitat's requirements would be, and they essentially modeled that across the landscape. So you could, your property may not have a rattlesnake on it, but there could be one nearby, and this would give you an idea that that's the case. Um, it doesn't give you uh, species level information, if you are in one of these areas and you are interested in what species kind of contributed to uh, that designation, you can reach out to me directly and I can provide you some the generalized information of what species it might be. Uh, we do this to protect the safety of uh, things like uh, some of the turtles that are vulnerable to collection, as well as plants um, that are also similarly vulnerable. So keep that in mind. If you're in an important area for wetland animals, uh, and you have a wetland on your site, um, that could be a focus of your management going forward, and it's good to know that. We also have significant natural communities. These are areas that are either rare communities or they're just really high quality examples of common communities. Uh, and if you click on them, they'll tell you exactly what community that is, and you can search it in their online database. Uh, this is a great resource. If you type again into this search box here, um, uh, some some kind of habitat that you that you found. Uh, it'll give you uh, how to identify that habitat as well as uh, how to conserve that habitat with specific management recommendations. So again, if you're in one of these areas, uh, that's great. Uh, I'll end on just knowing that there's these there's uh, existing webinar recordings for the forest condition index uh, and important areas, uh, as well as the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper. Um, I could talk about this forever, but we don't have the time. So here is the link here, and we'll share that again. But that's all I got. Great, Nate. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we got um, take five minutes now for a quick stretch break. Um, if anyone does have questions for either Nate or myself pertaining to the, any of these tools, we realize that's a, a lot of information to uh, to digest all at once, but. Uh, yeah, again, there's going to be links to uh, to all these tools and, and 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 guides and other webinars on how to use them. So uh, feel free to take five minutes. Um, we'll readjourn or we'll come at seven ten. Uh, if anyone has questions for Nate or myself in the meantime, just throw them in the chat box or or raise your hand, and we'll we'll be sure to answer them.
Hey, Nate, I don't know if you responded to it, but earlier on, uh, while you were presenting, there was a question um, from Charles, uh, who asked if um, invasive uh, multiflora rose was preferred to grass. Did you see that? Oh, you're muted, by the way. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I did see that earlier. Um, I know that that came up in the last conversation uh, that we had last week. Uh, in, in my mind, uh, invasives is a tricky thing. Um, there, there's kind of a sense of realism that you have to have about managing them uh, and the realisticness of actually eradicating anything. Uh, and, you know, having multiflora rose, it, just because it's there and it's invasive doesn't mean that it doesn't have positives. Um, it definitely does provide habitat. I mean, that, that is why it was originally introduced um, <laughs> and became invasive. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that, it, you know, that, that you have to ignore it, but uh, I think it's better than grass. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> Maintained lawn. Um, it, could prob it probably will end up uh, kind of sheltering some other associated plants from deer browse, which, which may be helpful. So, um, and it's so widespread in the landscape that Anytime you manage something like that, it's never going to be, it'll always be brought in by birds. Um, and that's kind of just a perennial issue with, with invasives is understanding kind of what vectors bring them into a landscape. Uh, so if it's dispersed by birds, you know, if you don't replace it with anything, uh, there's a good chance that it'll come right back. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, these, there's no real easy answers to invasive species questions I found. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, and and again, for anyone who does have more specific questions pertaining to invasives, uh, our our master gardener and, and resource educator Joyce Tomaselli will be giving a good overview uh, next next week, next session on invasives and. Um, Joyce, I don't know if you're around, if you're taking a break, or if you have anything you want to weigh in on that. Um, but if, if not, I'm sure she'll bring it up uh, in the context of her conversation next week. So we'll start back up in just another minute here. Uh, grab a glass of water. One other thing I just wanted to mention, um, I did get a question um, regarding the, uh, the contacts list. And uh, by all means, we, we, we don't want to, um, if, if, if you we want to respect your privacy, if you don't want your name um, or, or information out there, uh, please l let me know in the chat box or shoot me an email. Um, uh, and we'll be sure to either exclude your name. Um, we weren't going to include contact information anyway, just a, a, a list of names and uh, what municipalities you all are from. So if, if that's something you'd rather be uh, excluded from, please let me know and we'll be sure to, to do that out of uh, respect for your privacy. All right, Nate, what do you think? Get back into it? Oh, you're still muted there. Uh, I know, I should be used to that. <laughs> yeah. um, it's probably a good time to get to that poll Right. Yeah, let's, keep, let's do that one again. Okay, another shot. So um, I think we can test your memory on what we learned earlier in the presentation here. Uh, so on aerial access, Dutchess County, uh, how old are the oldest images? You have kind of a suite of images you can choose from. Um, pick which one you think is the oldest. All right, the responses are coming in. Looking like a looking like a landslide so far. Yeah, everyone's doing pretty good. I think you just gave it away, Sean. Uh, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, yeah, but they can't see it until we end the polling. That's true. All right, let's we'll take two more seconds here. 
All right, let's see. Well, it was a slide. I guess you all were paying attention or you were fiddling around with it, um, both of which are, are great things. So congrats, 1936. Um, really amazing. I love Ulster County. I, I really wish I had access to that data. Um, I'm stuck with much more recent aerial photos. All right. So moving on, we we'll talk a little bit about mapping your property. We've looked at uh, several mapping mappers that can be used to, to do this, um, but this is going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of um, taking that draft map you have and maybe sprucing it up a little bit. Okay. So I wanted to lay out a process. I think it's helpful, uh, definitely helpful for me to do it in this way. Uh, the first thing is to come up with a vision statement. We didn't do this formally, I don't think, but just you know, figuring out what you want out of your property and, and just saying it out loud can really uh, focus you on uh, mapping and understanding the parts of the property that are most important. So that's your first step. Then you want to collect some data, you know, it could be something as uh, in-depth as this meadow vegetation survey out in a field, um, or it could be going to aerial access and, and learning that your house used to be on a larger um, dairy farm support land. Um, or any of the amazing kind of larger scale data sets that we have in the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper or Parcel Access. So that's a step. Then you want to take your vision statement and turn it into some goals, uh, maybe some more realistic goals. I don't think that, uh, I think I might be able to turn my property in the Yosemite, but definitely not going to be in any less cake anytime soon. And then you know, you want to redraw that map. It's great that you already have a sketch. Um, you know, if you're doing it by hand, you'll find that getting everything to scale can be really tedious. Um, so it always helps to practice. And then use that to, to kind of plan, prioritize, and, and, and ultimately manage your property. Uh, this is what I'm advocating. So uh, we're going to start uh, with this case study using my yard, kind of similar to what Michelle did. Um, that was uh, a, a great example and definitely inspired me. Uh, so we have here my own property here. Uh, you can see it's, it's on a large river. Uh, it's about 1.09 acres, but a lot of that's underwater, uh, which is a bummer. Got one house, a barn, some associated gardens. Um, we also have well and septic. That's something that is uh, really important to understand. Um, because you don't want to be planting trees over your septic field or a uh, willow next to your well. Uh, I do have a family, so I guess if I didn't have one, I might be more inclined to just let the whole thing revert to a natural state, um, but I got to keep them occupied. And I got a couple wild dogs um, that would love to just terrorize any living thing that they could get their paws on. So these are all considerations for me going into this. Uh, a little introduction to the property. Uh, I don't have the lines on this map, but you can see the front of the house here. Um, this is kind of an old, you know, style of having the house right on the road here. Uh, and it's actually a really fabulous design for, for habitat because we have this kind of back portion of the property that's a little bit more wild and, uh, you know, business is up front. Here's another view of kind of this large lawn area that goes down to the water there. Uh, and from that barn structure, we have a view. This is... Uh, my garden and then uh, kind of lawn all the way down to the water. Blank slate, so to say. So where do I start? I came up with this vision statement, might be a little too wordy, uh, but my approximately acre property complements and enhances the habitat values of adjacent natural areas while providing me with a safe place to grow food, play, and maintain my property value and my sanity. So, so, so let me just dissect that really quickly. Uh, the, the main goal, I think, is going to come out to be something that complements and enhances the habitat values of the area, the adjacent natural area. I live on a small parcel, and so what I do is a, of less value maybe than my neighbors, but I can definitely enhance kind of the existing values of natural areas next to me. Uh, and I think that's an important principle. Uh, I also want it to be a safe place, so I want to prioritize safety. Um, and I want to uh, garden my own food 
have access to recreational amenities like the river, uh, and important for me, maintaining my property value. Uh, there is a view associated with my property, and that you know is where a lot of the value is tied, and I really don't want to uh, undo that because I do uh, need that investment. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and my sanity. I think Sean said before, prioritization is important. Uh, not biting off more than you can chew and not getting overwhelmed with uh, trying to address everything that you identify as a problem, at least all at once. So, uh, after we have that vision statement, next thing we want to do is uh, collect data. So, a good place to start is your survey if you have one. If not, that's fine. I don't have one. Um, but they can be a useful way to understand uh, where you're managing to make sure you're not planting stuff on your neighbor's property. Uh, also looking into whether you have easements or right-of-ways, these kind of restrictions can, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're in compliance with these restrictions so that you don't get a nasty surprise down the road and someone asks you to undo all your hard work. Uh, we can use mappers. We, we talked a little bit about uh, the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper and some of Dutchess County's mappers. Um, these are all great resources, though it can be really intim intimidating, right? It can be really overwhelming to see all this data and say, how am I going to figure this out? Like, how am I going to incorporate this into my mapping and my management? Uh, and, and that's why we have checklists. So uh, we did, we do have copies of this checklist available. Um, I filled it out for my property, and I think it'd be helpful if we all just ran through it and, and saw exactly how this might play out on a real life property. Uh, before I get into that, uh, I do I did want to look into some of the historic features of my property. Uh, again, because I don't have aerial access, because um, I'm in Ulster County, uh, I only have this 1994 aerial image. Um, it's maybe a little hard to read if you're not used to looking at color infrared. Um, but the, the takeaway message is my, my property is pretty much unchanged since 1994. Um, though there is a, a lengthy history of this property. So now that I know that, I can indicate that at the notes section at the bottom of this checklist. But when I go back up to the top, the first thing that I, I see is um, what watershed am I in? And, and I noted Huck 12. I, again, that's the smallest one. Uh, and for me, that's the 12 scale brook uh, Rondout Creek watershed. Good to know. Next, getting into streams and watersheds, uh, you might notice that this is following the format of the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper, so you can go down and check, check, check. Um, you'll see also that there's uh, found on my property and found adjacent or nearby. Because some of these mapped layers aren't necessarily uh, accurate at the scales we're looking at, it's important to look at what's nearby. You may have an important area for wetland animals two properties over, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not still important to those animals. It just means that, uh, you know, it wasn't picked up in that survey. So um, it's important to understand what's nearby and use that in your decision making. So for me, I have the riparian buffer area that showed up. Um, a stream showed up. Again, this is, uh, in my case, the Rondau Creek. Uh, I know that from, from many sources. Uh, but the stream condition index says that it's of average quality and it's regulated as a class B stream, which means that the bed and banks are regulated by DVC. Um, so already I know quite a bit, but I know that the stream is looking like a, or the, I'm sorry, the Rondout Creek is looking like the major kind of conservation target on my property. Um, we also have a FEMA flood hazard zone in both the 100 and 500 year floodplains. So, um, Again, even more evidence that that's a really important feature on my property. So if you map that, you say, wow, that's a big floodplain. Um, <laughs> lucky for me, it's the 0.2% annual chance. So that's a 500 year event. Um, talking to uh, neighbors, they said that the floodwaters went up to around this level here in Hurricane Irene. So um, the house is up fine. Um, but anyway, it's, it's important for me to know that this is really a floodplain and, and, you know, any restoration I do in this area could have some real serious positive habitat uh, effects, you know, um, floodplains, forested floodplains in particular are, are, are immensely valuable and kind of a rare um, habitat type in the Hudson Valley. Uh, but also there's a kind of flood attenuation downstream from 
uh, reforesting uh, uh, floodplain areas. So um, again, already learning so much. Here we have wetlands. I didn't see any regulatory wetlands, so nothing big. Uh, National Wetland Inventory didn't pick up anything, but I did come by a probable wetland from soil drainage. So again, that's from the county soil maps. And you can see right here down by the water, um, kind of at the toe of the slope. Um, this property is gently sloping, so you're not missing out with any topography here. Um, I don't think it would really show up on this map anyway. But this is picking up some wetlands here. So that'll take me going out in the field and, and taking a good look and seeing if, uh, if it's soggy up. Okay, forest condition index. I don't have any forests on my property. Um, immediately adjacent to me. There's uh, not a whole lot of forest on my property, but there is this um, big 75 percentile forest just across the Rondout Creek from me. So I'd say, yeah, that's adjacent to my property. Um, not only that, but it's in the top five for landform diversity. So I, I, that necessarily won't help my management, but it is interesting to know that, uh, you know, that forest is really important because there's a lot of different microclimates. There's, uh, you know, kind of deep ravines and uh, you know, lowlands and some uplands. Um, and, and, and from being on that property, I, I do know that is. Um, we also have important areas, uh, important areas for bat foraging. That's a really cool layer that was developed, um, basically looking at rare bat species and seeing you know, what their most important areas are outside of where they uh, hibernate. And this is especially important uh, with white nose syndrome decimating local bat populations. So I'm in an important bat foraging area, and I'm also in an important area for migratory fish. Uh, American eel actually showed up when I looked at the uh, migratory fish layer. Um, so I know that my property is important for the health of maintaining the health of that species. Uh, I also have notes at the bottom. Again, when you're out in the field or um, you wanna kind of qualify some of the things in this checklist, uh, Go crazy on the notes. You, you'll thank yourself later. Okay, so yeah, I just want to kind of visualize that relationship with the forest here. This is that big forest I was talking about, the 75th percentile one. It's a pretty nice, uh, you know, uh, high quality forest here. It's not quite as high quality as this one. Um, but my property actually looks like it's somewhat of a, a kind of a pinch point or, you know, part of a potential corridor between, the, between these areas. So strengthening, you know, forested areas on my property could really um, have kind of regional uh, impacts on species, uh, notably birds that can move pretty easily as they pass between these two large forested areas. Um, okay, so getting into, uh, you know, kind of filling in some of those gaps, uh, the mappers aren't going to cover everything. We have a natural resources inventory for the town of Rosendale. So I, I, I looked and one thing that's not on the mappers is the agricultural information. So I live within uh, prime farm soils, uh, which is very helpful to know. Uh, I also know from my mapper experience that I'm in the Rondout Creek watershed and that there's an interim watershed management plan for that area. So um, that can help me kind of tie in with that group, uh, maybe learn a little bit more about the stream, uh, maybe help coordinate some kind of planting on my property. If it's a, a large enough area, they might be uh, willing to help if it's contributing toward protecting the resource that they're protecting. Um, so those are some other uh, kind of filling in the gaps resources. And we're just gonna keep on filling those gaps because <laughs> they always seem to crop up. Uh, talk to your neighbors. Uh, I learned in talking to my neighbors uh, that my property was a part of the DNH canal uh, lock system that, um, you know, basically brought coal from Pennsylvania to New York City. Um, so that got me to go to the DNH Canal Museum and learn a little bit about the hamlet that I live in and, and how that, uh, you know, canal was a, a part of it. Um, I don't have old aerial photos, but I do know that my property was probably pretty denuded um, during that time. I know there was a lot of forest fires, things were cleared, a lot of pollution. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely not living in a pristine place. And that'll be helpful in kind of understanding what's possible on that property. Uh, and then walk your land, take notes, um, take a sketch. I'm sure you've already done this, but we're going to go into a 
one more time. I want to get a little bit more detailed than maybe you were doing before. Um, so what do you observe in your yard? Uh, I used a model from the, the National Wildlife Federation. They have a program that certifies wildlife habitat. Uh, and it's, it's pretty simple sort of collection of features that if you have all four of them, you can get a certified plaque. Um, but this is the cheap version of that in my presentation here. So the first one that you need on your property is food. Uh, and plants are food. You know, plants form the basis of all food webs. Uh, and so it's, it's important that, you know, the higher the diversity of plants you have, the higher the diversity of plant predators you have. And then ultimately the higher diversity of predators you have, like this uh, ferocious wild turkey that eats both uh, plants and insects. Um, so again, you can see that really just promoting the highest number of native plants on your property um, can really uh, boost wildlife population significantly. Uh, I think we were discussing internally before, Doug Ptolemy, um, researcher, I don't know if anyone has that link to share, but he has given a lot of presentations on his research on insects and really demonstrating that native plants produce such, so much higher volumes of insects. And these insects are needed for, for birds. Um, birds need uh, tremendous quantities of insects to feed developing broods in the spring and throughout the year. Uh, and native plants are, are really the powerhouse that, that introduced plants uh, can never really be. And I just want to showcase some pictures that my stepdad has been taking since his quarantine uh, during Corona. Uh, these are just really great examples of how wildlife depends on plants and uh, yeah, everything from mammals, uh, you know, beaver actually do eat trees. It probably wasn't trying to eat this one, but uh, uh, they do eat smaller shrubby trees um, as well as flowers and nectaring for pollinators, all important. Animals also need places to re raise young. Um, keep in mind that, you know, these, these features can all be mapped. Um, and so you should be definitely looking at what, which of these are on your property, uh, learning to identify them and, and putting them on your map. Um, so here we have mature trees. That seems obvious and meadow. A lot of people in their maps have already have those features mapped. Um, but things like, uh, you know, host pat plants for caterpillars. You may want to map where your milkweed is on your property. Uh, I know uh, Judith Kopova was talking last week about, you know, her milkweed and monarch butterflies. Uh, it can be really great to understand kind of the patterns of where those milkweeds are. They are, uh, in fact, perennial plants. Uh, dead trees, very important. Um, a lot of people, again, try to vacuum the forest. I loved that graphic from Julie. Um, but you know, leaving as much standing dead trees where they, where they don't cause a hazard uh, and down trees uh, really provides a tremendous amount of habitat. Um, as well as dense shrubs or a thicket. I think this gets back to kind of that multi-floor rose question. Um, you know, I have a thicket in my backyard and it's mostly invasive, but I don't have the capacity to deal with it right now. And I can acknowledge that it is in fact providing wildlife habitat. Here are just some more examples of different types of habitat. You have tent caterpillars on a, uh, you know, cherry tree. You have uh, a bobolink that requires large uh, grasslands to, for protection against predators like foxes. Um, so they need those big meadows. And you have this wood duck in this box here. And you know, that, that can be a great way to promote wildlife. But if you're able to leave that large tree with those cavities, you'll notice that those holes from woodpeckers look strikingly similar to that uh, nest box hole. Um, and that's really what they're trying to replace. So wherever you can leave a feature like that uh, on your property where it's not uh, endangering anyone, uh, you should definitely attempt to do that. Okay, we also have, sorry, I have to move this box here. We have cover, right? So this is where wildlife seeks cover like a bramble patch. Um, you know, blackberries are obviously great. Um, some are invasive, right? You might have a uh, wineberry, um, but they can provide cover for wildlife. Rock piles and walls, stone walls provide fantastic habitat for things like uh, snakes, because not only does it provide basking habitat, but also places for, uh, for rodents to kind of, um, you know, be ready for the taking. Uh, again, we have these caves. 
Um, also like large boulder piles, things like that, they tend to be den sites for things like bobcats. Um, so those are great things to leave. Roosting box for bats um, or, or large trees, those are other great um, options. Uh, so yeah, I'll let you look at these lists for a second more. You can see uh, right here, this is a brush pile and you have this brush sitting on top of it. Um, as soon as you set up one of these brush piles, just, you know, simply big logs with progressively smaller sticks piled on them, you'll notice birds flock to them. Um, it's a great perch for them. Uh, and, and yeah, it's just a fun thing. Uh, also things like stacking wood and stumps, all, all great features to have. And water, you know, uh, many people are blessed to be able to have great water features like a large wetland or a stream or a river or a pond. Um, but some people maybe don't have any water. Uh, in that case, you know, a bird bath or a butterfly puddling area, a rain garden, these are great ways to incorporate water in your landscape. We don't generally recommend ponds because they usually are dug out from existing wetlands. Uh, and so generally they don't really replace the values and the diversity that that original habitat had. Uh, so you generally don't advocate for the creation of new ponds, uh, but if you do have a pond, you know, you can definitely work to make that better. And uh, next week's session, we'll get into kind of enhancing all of these features on your property. And here we just have some more examples of water. This is breeding, uh, also breeding habitat for things like spotted salamanders. Uh, that vernal pool on the left. This uh, on the right is a picture of a mountain dusky that was taken in a spring, just kind of a little bubble of water underneath a rock somewhere on the side of a hill. Um, but also keep in mind, you know, bats. You have this picture up in the right hand corner. Um, may not seem like an aquatic species, but you know, they're hunting insects that require water. So they're actually very dependent on being, you know, within at least a half or quarter mile from, from a large water source. Okay, so getting into some of the identification of these things, uh, guidebooks are obviously, you know, extremely helpful. Knowing your trees um, is an easy one to get started with. Uh, there's also resources for um, wildflowers, and grasses, and uh, we'd be happy to point you to those if you want to follow up um, after uh, the webinar. Um, some of our other speakers might be able to wait. Uh, phone apps can be really helpful, a uh, great new tool. Uh, I haven't used a lot of these, but um, I heard from Sean that uh, iNaturalist puts out an app called Seek that uh, where you just take a picture like that and, and you know you can get kind of a guess identification right there and then. So um, if you do have a smartphone, that's a great resource. Many websites have keys on them, dichotomous keys that you can kind of enter information uh, about you know, what you see on a plant, you know, whether they're opposite branching, uh, whether, you know, there's, uh, the leaves are compound or simple, um, and you'll learn all of these ID characteristics. So there's also the Lower Hudson Prism, um, you know, they focus, this is the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, they focus on, uh, uh, you know, providing information on invasives. So if you want to learn how to identify uh, some of the common and more emerging invasives, uh, they might be the go-to folks for you. Habitats. Uh, identifying habitats can be a little easier. We saw some people looking at, you know, they saw that they have woods or they have grassland. Um, this is a great place to start, um, but you can also get a little bit more specific. Here we have um, the organization Hudsonia has a great resource of habitat fact sheets. Uh, and you can learn a lot about how to identify and differentiate between some of the more common habitats. A great habitat fact sheet that I like is the Backyards for Biodiversity. Um, this has kind of some helpful tips on managing your, prop your smaller uh, properties for biodiversity. So you can find that in the same place as this resource. And then the Natural Heritage Program also has kind of more in-depth conservation guides I was talking about this before in relation to the, the mapper and looking at rare communities. Um, so this may be a little too specific for a lot of folks, but uh, it has a lot of information, conservation and management, uh, it has the ranges of species. Um, so definitely worth checking out uh, at guides.nearnaturalheritageprogram.org. 
Okay. So now, you know, I, I, I try to have some resources in hand. I'm looking at my kind of front yard area and see a large tree here. Uh, not quite sure what that is. So I'll have to get a guide and, and figure that out or maybe ask some people. Um, I know this is a walnut because it rains down walnut hell every <laughs> fall, especially on good crop years. Um, so that I already have known. And then we have this perennial kind of flower bed. It has some natives, some non-natives, uh, non uh, and I've been kind of slowly trying to identify the plants in those. But at the very least, it's my little patch of, uh, of, of meadow. In the backyard, we have some conifer trees. Uh, I've definitely heard um, some uh, owls back there in the past. Uh, and then we have the large water feature. It definitely contributes, um, in my case, to kind of probably drives most of the biodiversity on my property. All right, so we're moving through this kind of process. We've collected all the information. Uh, we've, uh, you know, expressed our vision statement. And I just wanted to get a little bit more specific on my goals now. Now that I kind of know what's there, I kind of know what I want. Uh, I want to maintain a safe place to raise a family. Um, I want to increase the number of low growing native plants. Um, so I want to kind of contribute to this forested area um, that's all around me, but I have this view that I want to maintain. So um, I could maintain it as a meadow, but I feel like it would be a lot more value in some kind of taller woody vegetation. Uh, so I'm, I want to increase the number of low-growing native plants, mostly shrubs. Uh, I want to grow a diversity of fruits and vegetables. Uh, I don't have a lot of fruit plants, um, so I'm willing to kind of have maybe some of these low-growing native plants might be some uh, wild fruits. Uh, I want to maintain my access to the back there and not look at things too wild. Um, and again, protect my property value. You'll, you'll notice that uh, goals kind of interact with each other and you can have one action that achieves many goals uh, or just one goal to one action. Um, but it, it is helpful to look at your property in this sort of context. All right, done with goals. Now we get to draw the map. That's the fun part. Um, I'm a little embarrassed because I saw some really good maps <laughs> going into this, um, but I will uh, open up my notepad and, and show you. Uh, I'm interested to see exactly what system uh, our earlier uh, presenter did for their, uh, for their map. I don't know if that was in CAD maybe. Um, some might use geographic information systems uh, or Microsoft Paint even is a great way to kind of put together something simple. Or I think someone had brought up uh, uh, PowerPoint. I use that as well sometimes. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna use pencil and paper. It's a lot of fun anyway. So you start by sketching your boundary you know, the major infrastructure, the things that you want to manage around uh, and make sure that you acknowledge uh, as you plan. So in my case, I have my septic field. Uh, I have my well that's kind of next to my house and the driveway uh, and some, some kind of established garden areas. The next step I want to do is take all that information I got from the checklists and talking to my neighbors um, uh, and, and just looking at uh, historical photos, everything that I've brought together, and I want to bring it into this one document. In my case, I kind of wrote it right next to the map here, um, but you, you could have even more information. So I suggest, you know, uh, getting a second piece of paper and, 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 and writing down kind of more detailed notes in that case. Because like I said, once you do all this stuff, um, you, you'll never you hate yourself for it. All right. And then you've I need a new term for filling the gaps, but <laughs> you just kind of finalize your map by putting everything in there. Um, you can see I have my, my walnut here. I didn't, I didn't put as much detail as some people did. Um, I have this tree ended up being a, a crab apple. It's not an invasive one, so I, I don't know how much of a priority that'll be for me removing. Uh, it is beautiful. I have my little conifer patch here, uh, as well as a dogwood down here, great native dogwood here. Uh, and you can see I have some woods. Um, this is one of those abiotic sort of features. Uh, this is a snag. Um, it's a standing dead tree with woodpecker holes. It's on my neighbor's property, but I do want to acknowledge that that's there and that that's probably providing habitat to some of the birds, some cover or brooding habitat. 
I have this thicket down here. I think I was describing it before. There's privet and um, kind of some not so good invasives, but um, they are kind of providing a buffer to the stream here. Uh, and then I have uh, a wetland, you know, the probable wetland layer, put it somewhere over here, um, but that's not bad. It turned out that it was kind of right in this little drainage area here. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of wetland sedges. Um, so that is a wetland. Uh, also, you'll note here, this kind of swoopy thing here, that that's the floodplain. So, um, you know, seeing that there's wetland here, kind of more naturalized floodplain, uh, kind of starting to suggest that opportunities to enhance that area um, for some of the benefits that we're looking for. I also like the idea that there's woods here and woods here, and then another natural feature in the river, and that anything I do in here, that's seeming like a priority for me because I'm going to create a larger connected natural area um, by kind of letting this return to somewhat of a wild state. That's my map. So I had a poll here. Do you want to see some of my management since doing all this? Um, and then I realized I don't need a poll because of course you do that. <laughs> Can't stop people from talking about what they can be doing on their property. So I'm going to run through this pretty quickly, but feel free to ask questions at some other point. So the first hey, thing hey, real quick before you, uh, we just have one particular question. Um, can, can a property still be certified wildlife habitat if there is an old dumping site nearby? Um, this person asked, the dumping site looks like uh, local refuse from many years ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, is the dump preferred? No, but animals do persist. Um, I think the certified wildlife habitat, you know, um, wildlife can find habitat out of a lot of things, but this is just a way of, um, you know, making sure that the critical elements are there. Uh, and cleaning up a dump can only improve that habitat, but it doesn't mean that the habitat's uh, not there. So that's a good question. I do have a dump actually in this picture kind of off the side of the bank there where in the thicket, you'll find thickets um, can be associated with dumps often. Um, <laughs> Um, all right, so I installed this fence here. Um, that was to keep my dogs out of this kind of wild area. I was just talking about this woods here, woods here, and I want to create this corridor that can buffer the stream from, you know, pollutants and, and attenuate floodwaters, but also kind of create connectivity here on a very small scale. So. Uh, the first step for me for that was making sure that the dogs don't go anywhere near anything that lives there. Uh, and that is at least partially successful um, when they don't jump over the fence. Next thing, I do uh, want to make a concerted effort to reforest my floodplain. Um, as I said before, I, I want to use kind of low growing shrubs. Um, in fact, you can see or partially see there's some deer fencing here uh, to keep out um, deer from a recently planted beech plum planting. Um, beech plum don't grow higher than, you know, 10 feet. So um, that's why I preference them for that site. Uh, right adjacent to the river, this is that wetland area. I put in some edible wetland plants. So I have some elderberry here. I've made elderberry syrup and jam for a few years, um, but now I'll have my own patch. Uh, some nannyberry up here that's also edible and some rose here make some rose. So, you know, putting this land to work for me, but in a, a very hands-off type way. By the way, I do have mugwort here as well, um, but it's not a priority for my management at this point. I'm hoping that the shrubs will grow up and partially shade out that mugwort, and I won't worry about it so much in this case. Uh, I'm reducing my lawn. Uh, so I can reduce lawn in a number of places, but I've chosen to do it next to the snag. The snag is out in the woods here. Uh, and this area here, I've uh, let go for a couple years. I'll basically hit it with the weed whacker um, every month or two months or so, just to keep it uh, easy to reclaim back to lawn again. Um, especially, like I said, to maintain the value. If I want to resell, maybe I want to have a more traditional looking lawn area. Um, so again, for me, I want to have this stuff closest to the kind of wild areas of my property uh, so that they can uh, kind of strengthen the, the adjacent areas, uh, natural areas of my property. I put up a bat box because I'm in that bat conservation area. Uh, and you can see the uh, kind of feces of success here at the bottom. Um, I was really excited to see that. 
Um, but I do have a couple bats that hang out in there. Um, and it's really satisfying to know that I'm contributing to, to potentially rare bat species. Uh, do some tree clearing. I always pile my brush and love watching the wildlife in there. Um, in this case, I'm also making some sort of sugar bush. So uh, opening up some uh, sugar maple trees and creating some wildlife habitat in the process. And I also burn wood. So I, this is just a great excuse for me. Anytime my wife asks me, uh, when are you going to clean up that wood pile? I just tell her that where are the snakes going to go? <laughs> and that generally uh, doesn't work for me. All right. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity to present. And um, I'll hand it back over to Sean again. Great, Nate. Thank you so much. Um, we do have uh, a little time for, for questions. Um, you know, any specific questions for Nate uh, on his property and some of his management goals? Um, or if there are any questions pertaining to uh, the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper or any of the other tools that we uh, that we mentioned tonight. So uh, if anyone does have questions that they want to answer in the chat box, um, I can also um, allow anyone to talk. If you want to raise your hand, there's that function. Uh, feel free to do so. So we'll take a minute or two and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, so we got one question from Chris. Uh, how do you decide more specifically which plants, shrubs, trees to plant? So many options. That's a great question. Um, you know that uh, if you're looking to plant something adjacent to a water course, um, Beth Ressler, who's also on this call and coordinates our uh, Trees for Trims program at the Estuary program, she is a great resource for technical assistance. Um, we provide you with uh, options for tree planting. Uh, I think if you, a lot of the places that, that um, sell native trees or provide them uh, at discount costs, costs I'm thinking of um, county, uh, and, and Joyce can speak to that a little bit, uh, or uh, the state DC uh, Saratoga Tree Nursery, the species that they have there. Um, people are often happy to, to talk about what they have available and what might do well on a certain site. Um, but I agree, it's really, it's really intimidating. Um, if you want to follow up with me afterwards, I'd be happy to run some suggestions by you, uh, depending on your site. Yeah, and Joyce just responded uh, next week, she'll be sharing some, some good examples. And, and I would imagine Beth is going to as well in her presentation. All right, great. Thanks, Joyce. Any other questions for Nate? All right, Nate. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And all right, I will take it back over here just to wrap us up. The final stretch here. I do see uh, someone brought up in the chat box. Um, sun and shade capped, and that, that's a fantastic point. Um, I did, in my map, um, put a north arrow and a scale bar, just because that's, uh, those are key elements to a map, but uh, also, you know, understanding what direction is north can help you understand what areas might be more shaded. Um, if you have the ability to kind of understand the areas that are shadier in your property, I would definitely recommend doing that. That's one of the critical, that and the availability of water are some of the most critical um, factors that plants need. So um, definitely that's a great point. Absolutely, great suggestion. Okay, um, so if, uh, if there's no more questions, um, we'll just wrap it up. I'll just introduce uh, the homework for tonight uh, or for this session. Um, again, kind of just wanted to um, reiterate that we're, we're, we're moving along. Uh, so Nate kind of laid out that, that, uh, that matrix of, you know, moving from your goals to beginning to understand what you have and, and moving and getting further detailed and further uh, elaboration on, on what we have. So as we transition from step two to step three, um, so Nate mentioned and, and, and showed that inventory checklist that we put together, and uh, that is also up on the, the landing page. 
uh, and part of the homework for this session. Uh, I'll, I'll also send that out via email so everyone has that uh, directly. Um, but we'll, we'll ask you to, to fill that out and um, to, to elaborate on the, the property sketch that you, um, that you put together for last week. All right, so there's that checklist. Uh, and then again, you know, adding more detail to your maps. Um, and we saw some, some, some oh, actually a pretty good range of, of sketches um, from the first assignment from uh, a little more basic, just kind of uh, quick drawing on a piece of paper all the way up to some, uh, some kind of more thought out and um, elaborate maps. But, so this next session will ask you to, to get a little bit more specific. Um, you know, Nate kind of mentioned this a little bit as well. Um, some examples, uh, some na naming more specific forest types, um, moving past your own property boundaries and including some features found on uh, neighboring or adjacent properties. Um, maybe marking, mapping some individual tree species that are of importance to you. Um, and then another thing that we, we didn't talk too much about, but you know, considering age class or, or size of, of plants or trees, you know, um, noting whether it's, it's a, you know, an early successional um, forest patch or, or, or a more mature one. It's another thing that we can take into consideration. So um, with that, I'll wrap up. And um, if there are any questions outstanding for either myself or Nate, uh, both of our email uh, contacts are below there. Uh, feel free to reach out to either one of us in particular. Uh, and if not, um, I'll just put in a plug for uh, the final week. Um, thank you all for, for sticking around through the second one. Uh, I know a lot of you want some information on some specific land management tech management techniques and uh, I promise that uh, next week we will get into some more of the nitty-gritty so stick through stick around with us for one more week um, appreciate everyone's time and um, hope you guys all have a great week uh, if again if there are any questions um, for, especially from any of the new registrants um, please feel free to reach out to me via email if there's any uh, information resources or any of these documents that you need so again thank you very much um, we do have uh, a couple of questions coming in, but I just want to acknowledge the time. Uh, if anyone needs to step off, feel free. Um, uh, Nate and myself and some of the other presenters will stick around to answer any other questions. Thank you all very much and have a great night.